I, I guess I can start. <laughs> okay. Assalamu alaikum. I would like to thank, of course, the professors, uh, Professor uh, uh, Ahmed and Professor Tawfiq for uh, making this happen. Uh, it's my second uh, talk uh, this year, 2021. I was asked to. Uh, talk about something I never talked about before and I will never talk about it again. So <laughs> selected something I hope of interest to you. So I selected something about sensing, right? So as, as human, we sense the environment, right? I mean, we see, we hear, touch. That's optical, acoustics, vibration, right? But uh, you cannot see far and you cannot hear far, and you cannot touch far, right? So you need sensors to help you to complement what God uh, has given you. Right? So I selected this topic because there was, or has been, so much uh, interest, uh, not only in the U.S., all over the world, about, about sensors. What are you sensing exactly? And what do you do to sense? Right? So there is a difference between the sensors you are using and what you are sensing, the scene that you are sensing. Right? So I selected the word sparsity because as you will see, you need to know something about what you sense. Okay, just to give you a kind of a general introduction. This room here is very busy. Right, chairs, these young ladies, uh, professors, right? If I remove everything and leave one chair, that becomes a sparse room. Only one. Right? If you look at the sky, it's empty. But when you see the moon, it becomes a sparse, sparse sky. Right? The, the stars and the moon, right? Also, there is, if there is an airplane, there is a plane going, right? So the sky is sparse. You have only one target, right? I mean, you cannot see, you look at the sky, you have 100,000 <laughs> planes flying, right? If you look underground, the soil is empty, but they can see cluster of rocks and things. So the soil is sparse because it has few items. So it's up to you to pretend that you don't know nothing about what you are trying to sense or to be aware that what you are sensing has so important property. You are looking for limited number of flaws in material. If there is a crack, you think the table has hundred thousand cracks eh, maybe one or two cracks flaws right that this table is sparse when it, it comes to cracks right so it's up to you to be sparse blind that means you ignore the fact that what you are sensing is sparse or to be sparse aware right being sparsity aware can get you places you never been there before can give you remarkable results and at the conclusion of this talk if I can communicate this message to you that will be mission accomplished right so what is sparsity right if you have a vector lots of zeros but two numbers that's a sparse vector a matrix lots of zeros few non-zero elements that's a sparse matrix Right? A scene that's background, almost empty, like a sky, and then I see a plane. That's a sparse scene. Right? A table with a flaw, that's a sparse. Right? Implies large homogeneous background. You know, here is a homogeneous, but there is a crack. Right? <laughs> sky is homogeneous, but there is a plane. Usually non-uniform occupancy. So when you have a sparse... If you have two cracks, do you think the cracks will be 
or three clocks will be equally spaced, like here, there. I think this is fine. Yeah. So usually, events happen in a kind of non-uniform, scattered. Right? And you have no control over it. So the question you have to ask yourself, in any kind of sensing, it doesn't matter what you are sensing. Are you aware that the solution of your problem is a sparse solution? A crack in a table, a plane in the sky, a human in a room, right? So are you sparsity aware or are you sparsity blind? So we'll talk about the sparsity blind, of course. So sparsity can be in the sensors. You say, well, how many sensors do you have in your pocket? Well, I have seven sensors, right? So you have limited number of sensors. Right? And where you place these sensors? And you're going to put them in a circle, on a line, in a rectangular. So that's sparsity in the sensors. The sparsity in the signals. I have only two frequencies. You see, but you have the entire band, frequency band, is uh, taken by somebody else. So all what I have is two, three frequencies. That's a sparse in frequency. A sparse in sampling, when you sample, you don't have all the samples. You cannot sample with a Nyquist, right? It's very wide band. So you have sparsity in the samples. So sparsity is not enough. You don't have the full data, right? For one reason or another, either imposed on you or by choice, you have limited number of observations. So the question here, is sparsity imposed or is your choice? Of course, when you have seven, you cannot have 100 million sensors, right? I mean, right? And if you have the sensors, you, you know, there is only uh, a finite space for this table. Where are you going to put the sensor in the air, right? So if you're going to put the sensor on the table, that is what they call, you know, the real estate, right? On the wing of the aircraft, I mean, that's it. You're not going to put place on the air, right? So sometimes how you place the sensors is imposed on you. Sometimes it is your own doing. And I would like to show you example of this and example of that. Sparsity and the sensors. So we sense the surrounding, right? Why would you sense? You want to detect. Is there something there or not? That's detection. Something in the body, a growth, that's detection. Where is it? That's localization. You cannot say there is some, there is, I, I, I found something in your body. I mean, where is it, <laughs> right? What is it? That's classification. Is there something there? Where is it? What is it? Can I, you predict and you can track? Usually we sense to answer these questions. So here, see and feel, you can do the acoustic optics and vibration, but you need sensors because electromagnetics, you cannot sense it. And then you cannot touch and see and hear things that are you know, 100 miles away. So if you categorize sensors, you, first of all, you say, what is the sensor modality? Is it acoustic sensors, ultrasound sensors, optical sensors? Vibration sensors, right? That's a called sensing modality. Sometimes you fuse. You say, I mean, I'm going to do optical and electromagnetic. That's radar, for example. And we do that all the time. And something we spoke about just a few minutes ago with the uh, uh, Professor Taufi about how you can uh, use more than one sensing modality for the same purpose. Then the sense respects. You say, well, the size, the cost, the weight. Right, uh, the gain, polarization, radiation pattern, so forth, so on. That's how we sp specify the property of the sensors. Most important is what this sensor, you can have passive sensors or active sensors. Passive sensors receive only. Passive sensors receive, it's called passive. 
active sensor radiates and receives. Acoustics, you radiate and receive. Ultrasound, you radiate and receive. Electromagnetics, you radiate and receive. That's called active. Right? So if you're going to radiate, what signal are you radiating? Narrow band, wide band? What kind of shape? Is it noise-like? Impulse-like? Chirp-like? So you have to decide, if you're going to sense, you have to decide what is the optimum waveform. Uh, then, is one sensor enough? The answer is absolutely no. The error of one sensor is gone. You have to have multiple sensors to localize, to resolve. For example, when I resolve those two ladies, I need to have sensors aperture like this so I can see less, that's why I have two eyes to resolve things in cross range right? you need to have the bandwidth to resolve in range so I need to have a frequency bandwidth to resolve those two ladies sitting behind each other and then I need an aperture to resolve in angle so I need multiple sensors then you have to ask yourself multiple sensors are they arranged in a line, in a circle, a rectangular? These are called co-located or distributed. I throw one here, one there, one here, one here, and one here. So if you give me seven sensors, I can put them in a line or I can distribute them. Who makes that decision and why? So the difference between co-located and distributed. Then you configure the sensor, as I mentioned, the linear, the circle, and so forth, so on. Then it becomes another very important, the aperture. Do you have physical aperture or you have synthetic? What do you mean physical and synthetic? Physical aperture, if you give me seven sensors, I put them on the table to look for the crack. What is synthetic? Oh, that's only one sensor. I place it here, collect the data, then I move it then collect the data, then I move it, then collect the data. So I create an aperture, but not physical, synthetic aperture. And the synthetic aperture, if you tell me the application, I tell you 90% of application are synthetic aperture. Okay. So this is all what you need to know about sensors in general. Then. So without multiple sensors, you can do almost nothing. So the physical aperture, you can see here, the acoustics, you can see the ultrasound, and you can see the antenna array, and you can see the GPS. We worked on the GPS for anti-jam, right? So these are physical. You have so many sensors together present. Of course, it's a rectangular array. This is circular array. This is physical aperture. Now, synthetic aperture, you send and receive, then you move, you send and receive. So you emulate an aperture, one sensor at a time. And this is done certainly in mapping uh, town and cities and roads from the sky. Satellite and synthetic aperture radar and all the things. So you can see here the plane is flying, right? You cannot put uh, 100 sensors in the sky, right? So the plane moves, radiates, receive, radiates, receive, keep going, like stop and go, right? It collects all the data, then it produces an image. You can see that's an image created by the synthetic Abisha radar. You can look into oil slicks in the ocean, and there are so many examples, you can look at ice pads and all the things. This is called synthetic aperture, right? That means all the sensors are not there simultaneously. No, the, the plane create that aperture, one sensor at a time by the virtue of flying. So you can see here, for example, this is circular aperture. So the plane, in Certain position around the circle radiates and receives, moves, radiates and receives, collects as if it has several sensors around the circle, but not 
in existence, it actually synthesizes those sensors. You can do ground-based. If I have a van uh, driving in the street looking at me, the van can radiate, receives, then keep going, radiates and receives. So by the time it starts to disappearing, they have collected several uh, measurements at different positions. Whether those positions existed at the same time or one at a time, that's not really my business. What I care about is that give me the data that you collected. Right? This is also uh, uh, a device, it's called through wall imaging, that from outside basically uh, they put it against the wall and uh, they radiate, then they move it, they radiate, so they can actually see what we are doing here by, uh, by this handheld device. This all electromagnetics. So in very simple terms, right, whether you have physical uh, or synthetic, well, physical gives you more options, certainly. So here, for example, you can have the transmitter and the receiver. You can say, I have N transmitters, M receivers. Sometimes you have transceivers. That means the transmitter is the receiver. Right? But in general, we say that you have a number of transmitters and a number of, of receivers. Right? Now, what do you transmit? You can transmit one signal at a time. That starts, everybody else is silent. And these are receivers. Then you transmit from the second and everybody receives. Then you transmit from the last and everybody receives. You re transmit sequentially or you cycle through. You cycle through your transmitters. Or you can transmit simultaneously. When you transmit simultaneously, you can transmit the same waveform or you can transmit orthogonal waveforms. If you transmit the same waveform, you can do a beam. That means again. So I want to see what's going on in this angle. Right? So I put all the energy towards this angle. That's called beam forming. Or the MIMO, multiple input MIMO output, you transmit orthogonal waveforms. Right? And you can have monostatic or bistatic. Monostatic, that means I transmit, receive. Bistatic is I transmit, he receives. And that is the stealth. Stealth technology is that you cannot see the plane. The plane, the radar cannot see it. What do you think? What do you mean the radar cannot see it? The stealth aircraft, when you transmit towards the aircraft, it doesn't bounce back to you. So the radar cannot see it. It bounces to somewhere else. <laughs> right? That is the, the main uh, premise of stealth. Right? That, that, that you cannot see it. it. It actually bounces, but it bounces somewhere else that not back to you. So, in imaging is so straightforward, whether you are doing ultrasound imaging, medical imaging, anything, right? You have transmitter and then you have receivers, right? So how do I image this room? I partition this room into pixels or boxels, whatever it is, right? Then I have a transmitter and I have receiver. I pretend, hypothesize, that there is a target there, there is a person there, right? So when I transmit, if there is a person there, that means it's going to delay, transmit delay, receive delay to sensor receiver one, right? And then it's going to be a different delay to sensor receiver two, a different delay to sensor receiver three. Since I'm pretending, hypothesizing, then I know these delays. So what I do, I compensate for the delays such that when I sum, I sum coherently, I synchronize. So I sum all of them, then I look, that's called detection, I look at it. Does it exceed the threshold? Yes, that means there is somebody there. Then I look into the guy next. I say, I pretend, I hypothesize that there is somebody there. Then I 
work with the delays such as that everything that comes in from this person is summed coherently and then I look at it is it high enough that means there is some that's basically the idea of imaging no matter what modality you are using right so right here uh, you can see that, uh, that there is a linear relationship between uh, the, the, the targets or, or the pixels and the measurement. The measurement, we put it in Y, X will be your scene. A is called the sensing matrix. That's really the delay, the delay from the transmitter to this back to the receiver. Right? Uh, So you can see the element of the uh, the element of the matrix here, right, between the m's transmitter and the n's receiver. It's very straightforward, by the way. Sometimes we put this two dimension or three dimension in a vector. It's easier to work with vectors than matrices, right? So that's the whole idea. But the linear relationship is so fundamental between the measurements, the returns, and the scene, the occupancy of the scene x, right? If this is a sparse scene, you'll find 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 7. That's called the sparse scene. Right? And give me an example where the scene you are, you are looking at is not sparse. Most of the cases are sparse. Right? Then we sense motions. Right? Whether it is acoustic ultrasound force, ultrasound and radar are very important. If I send a signal and it bounces from a young lady, the frequency I send, since she's not moving, is equal to the frequency I receive. If she's moving towards me, the frequency I receive is higher than the frequency I transmit. If she's moving away from me, the frequency I receive back from bouncing from her is smaller than. That's called Doppler frequency. That, that's how they detect motions, whether it's blood in your vein or plane in the sky. Right? So this is called the Doppler frequency. Right? Of course, if the person is not moving with velocity zero, you get zero. So this is the velocity of the person, of the target, speed of light, transmitted frequency. This is the difference in the transmitted end frequency. Right? So if, if, a, if, a, if what you are sensing is stationary, there is no Doppler. There is no difference, right? So I cannot detect. But many of the things that we look at, they move. If they don't move, the difficulty becomes three, four poles. You know, looking at uh, things buried in the ground, very difficult. Like IED and all the things, business, uh, nothing moves, right? But if you look at human, human always moves. Professor Ahmed did something like this right now. By the virtue of this motion, I can see him. He doesn't have to walk towards me. If he moves any limp in his body, I can see him, right? Because he has a Doppler. He creates FD. It could be very small. That's why the, very, the, the, uh, uh, the millimeter wave now is very important. Why? Because this frequency here, FT, when you have 60 gigahertz, any small motion will be very visible because when you this increases, this increase. So they use the millimeter wave 66 gigahertz. And the, the automotive radar, right? They can see the deer crossing, right? We can distinguish between a deer crossing in the street and a human, right? Automotive radar. Because now we very high frequencies. So that is important. So it's just an example, right? If I have a radar, this one, looking at this human, these are all in motions, right? Falling, sitting, uh, you know, uh, bending, uh, walking, right? If I transmit a frequency and receive from bouncing from, he's now a, uh, is my former PhD student, right? Uh, that Doppler, is not constant, of course, because when you move your arm, you know, here is the high velocity, this is zero velocity, so the Doppler is not fixed, it's not a fixed frequency, it's a confluence, confluence of different frequencies, right? So if I 
try to find which frequencies, which Doppler frequencies exist at which times. By the way, it's very important, this called time frequency domain. And you will see why. So I'm not, in, I'm not interested in what frequencies exist. You say, take the Fourier transform, right? Fourier transform tells you what is, what is the frequency makeup of the signal, you know. Tell me what frequencies exist. That's Fourier transform, right? But tell me what frequency exists now versus what frequency exists a minute later. You have to look into a window. You have to window the data so you can tell me what frequency exists within this window in this time, right? And since this motion, right, the Doppler changes because the limbs changes. So I put a window and compute the Fourier transform to find the frequency. I plot them. So the horizontal is time and the vertical is frequency. So this will be the time frequency representation of falling. You see his head is right here. This is very high negative frequency because this is frequency. He's moving away from the radar. That's why it is negative. Right? Negative Doppler, right? is, is uh, uh, meaning away, right? This is sitting, uh, this is bending, and, and this is walking, right? So I sensed, I converted it to an image such as that my eye can be the classifier, right? If I am trained enough and you give me this, it says somebody fell. Now we do artificial intelligence and machine learning and all the things, right? but does not substitute for your own expert eye, right? Now, you can switch between sensing modality. What do you mean switching? I can emit electromagnetics for somebody walking and generate the time frequency signature of this person. That's, by the way, time, again. This is frequency, right? So this is actually his, his foot. See, when you walk, your foot accelerates, stops, and decelerates again. Maximum Doppler is actually when your foot is right here. This is zero Doppler at the very end, like a pendulum. So this is the Doppler signature of you walking. I convert it into time frequency. I can see it as he's walking. But now, it is a signal. Once it is a signal, it's a current, I can play it any way I like. I can play this acoustically. So if I take this waveform into a speaker, I can hear it. Now, this is not, this is not your footsteps, <laughs> right? This is your Doppler frequency walking by the radar, but I chose to use my ear as a clarifier, so I played it acoustically, right? So it's very interesting because suppose now you are running what do you think the Doppler signature played acoustically of somebody running? Again, I emit electromagnetic waves. I receive it. I bring it to baseband. Then I say, well, I'm going to hook it to a speaker. This is walking. Running. So if I'm outside the building with a radar, I can actually tell you that somebody running inside this room. This is fighting. If there is a fighting going on in a room, right, I can play this, hear it acoustically. So what are you saying? I say, oh, the sensing modality is not firmed, right? You can change the sensing modality, you can emit, receive, then you display or you play what you sensed in a different modality, right? So it's up to you, right? Now, 
that is sparsity, let's say the sparsity of the sensors. Let's start now with the sparsity of the sensors. So I men mentioned to you about synthetic aperture. So I want to image nine universities, right? I want to find out where are the rooms, the buildings, and all the things. Where is Dr. Ahmed is sitting? Right. So I cannot put sensors, physical sensors. I'm going to do, do synthetic aperture, right? So I have a van. It's going to be stop and go. Every time it stops, it emits, it receives, then it keeps going. Stops, receives, right? And what does it emit? It emits a waveform with different frequency. What you see here, these are different frequencies you know, in, a, in a bandwidth, right? You can partition the bands with different frequencies, right? right? And then it moves, emits, receives, it moves, emits, receives, it moves, emits, receives. By the way, it emits that resolution in range. The virtue of moving, that's resolution in angle. So now I know everything. By the end of the surveillance, right, I have all the data I need. I have the positions of my antennas, and I have all the frequencies. Thank you very much. Now I go, and I do exactly what I explained to you regarding the radar imaging or the imaging in general. I create very detailed things of my universe. So the vertical and the horizontal, so I have all the sensor positions and I have all the frequencies. I call this full data. Or complete data. So, as we mentioned before, I put the scene in a vector, right? I don't know the reflections, of course. And I know the measurement in a y vector. And A will be the sensing matrix, which is a delay. I emit it hits the podium and comes back, the delay, and all the things that we talked about. It's a linear relationship. And it's not easy to construct uh, the A matrix, right? We call this a sensing matrix. And we usually, here is the measurements, y, that is in your hand, x is unknown, that is building the, the building, I don't know what this is building about, a I know, right? So I solve for x, right? Usually I multiply by a Hermitian, right? So x will be uh, a Hermitian, a, and we call this, by the way, the uh, point spread function. Okay, very straightforward, called back projections. Okay, linear relationship. Now, look at this. I am moving, right, trying to look into this building, but there is a there is a car parked. I cannot see electromagnetically. There is a metal does not penetrate this car. So what are you saying? I'm saying this position is taken, right? You cannot, this position, you cannot collect anything, right? Another thing, right? So, when when I have, I'm trying to look into a building and there is incoming traffic like the bus, right? It's going to block my eyes, not visually, electromagnetically, right? So that position is also taken. How about if there is a tree or there is a light pole? I cannot, I cannot see that that position is taken. So what are you saying? I'm saying, listen, out of all of these positions that you think you can have, unfortunately, few of them are gone not by choice, are gone because the logistical difficulty of collecting the data. You cannot have access to these positions. So the complete data is no longer complete, sir. 
the complete data is no longer complete. There is something else, right? So all of a sudden, those rows are taken, right? Let's talk about the frequency and, and the jamming and all the things. Those frequencies are not yours. There is somebody else using some of these frequencies. You are not allowed to use all the frequency because you are either infringing on someone or somebody is infringing on you. So some of these frequencies that you think you have, unfortunately, not available to you. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the, some of the positions are taken and now you have white. Those frequency bands are taken. So all of a sudden, you have rows are eliminated <laughs> and columns are eliminated, right? And in general, the frequency can be different, right? So all of a sudden, instead of all this dark that you think that you have, you have 3% of the data. Good luck. You have 3% of the data. You're going to get very distorted information, unreliable. And this is not by choice. So you think you could get this, all the frequencies, all the antenna positions. By the way, this doesn't have to be antennas. It can be ultrasound sensors. It can be acoustic sensors, right? You have this. Only those dark are available. This position, this frequency. <laughs> it is a problem. You have sparsity in the sensors and you have sparsity in the frequency in the signals that what we call sparsity in the sensors right? because incomplete data i call it incomplete the professor called it compressed observations compressed So, if you do business as usual, and you multiply by the A Hermitian, now your A is no longer, that was the A. Now you have A delta that corresponds to this one, right? And if you do the point spread function, you get very distorted results. So, if you say, well, there's nothing I can do. I mean, I have only 3% of the data, so I'm going to continue business as usual, multiply by the A Hermitian, you're going to get garbage. So if you choose to be sparsity blind in terms of your sensors, you're going to pay a price. So things that you can take away thus far, compressed observations or complete data. You can have compressed spatial observations. Your views are blocked. You have compressed frequency observations. Some of the frequencies are not available to you. Compressed time observations. Some of the samples are not available to you. And you have to ask yourself, is this by uh, uh, choice or is it forced to you? Intentionally or, un or unintentionally? Sometimes, by the way, it is intentionally. Why would you skip position? I, I would like to uh, do fast data acquisition. I don't have the time to stop and go, right? I don't want anybody to see me, right, if I do surveillance, right? So I stop at three, four positions, right? So sometimes a good justification of limited data, I don't have the memory. I don't have the memory to store. I don't have the time to acquire. Right? So sometimes, you know, it's, you know, you are allowed to use all frequency, all positions, but you choose not to. Just to give you a simple example about what happened if you don't have incomplete. These are three targets in a scene. This is an image. You can see where the targets are, right? Clearly. Right? This is by the full data. Now, with 20% of the data, You get this. 
if you, you know, if you say, well, I'm going to just do business as usual, collect, get the A matrix, A Hermitian, you get this one. So you have to do something. The things that you haven't done yet is you should have recognized, should have realized. There's only three targets in the scene. So you have not utilized, you have not exploited the fact that there is a sparsity in the sensed. So you have sparsity in the sensors because there is no available positions of the antenna, there is not enough availability of the frequencies. Right? But the good news is, somebody twisted your arm in collecting the data, but hinted to you what you are sensing is sparse. This will equalize this. I'm going to show you that I can recover this exact scene from, from the full data, from the 20% of the data, if I utilize that what I am seeing is sparse. Right? So a sparsity of the sensed equalize, compensate for a sparsity in the sensor. So that's another example. This is a signal, a waveform. I only collected 25% of the samples. And I did the same thing, the time frequency. That's what I get. If I had the full data, this signal actually is two components. A sinusoid, see? This is frequency. It's a constant frequency. Sin, over, this is time. So it's a constant, and this is chirp. Chirp is a signal whose frequency increases linearly. Right? So, so the problems. Incomplete data or compressed observations can compromise sensing if conventional sensing approaches are used. So what do you want me to do? We need you to utilize the fact that what you are sensing is sparse. That is, you need to be sparsity aware. Otherwise, you're going to pay a hefty price. By being sparsity aware, even with 20% of the data, I can get you the exact, even better images than the full data. But you have to recognize that this is sparse. Look at the background. Empty, empty, empty. Empty, 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 empty. The occupancy. When you say, what is the occupancy of this room? If I'm outside, say, well, there is 100 seats here. But Professor Amin, the occupancy is sparse. That means very few people attending. <laughs> Try to get you closer to the meaning, right? Or the other seats are empty, are available are vacant. Can sparsity away overcome the effect of incomplete data? Yes. Let's talk about the sparsity of the signal now. So this is a sinusoid over time. Busy. What do you mean busy? Well, if you plot a sinusoid, it has contributions at every time sample, right? But if you take the Fourier transform, there's only two frequencies, right? Positive, negative, because it's a real number. So over the frequency axis, the signal is sparse. Over the time axis is busy. So what are you saying? I'm saying it could be a transformation that converts busy to sparse. Even if you add another sinusoid, you add two others, it's still sparse. Four components. Right. This is a chirp, a signal that frequency, you can see the frequencies increases with time. If I take the Fourier chart, so this is busy. At any given time sample, there is a component. Right. If you take the Fourier transform, it's also busy because it's a chirp, it's a wide band, right? <laughs> so 
you know, all contribution exists, you know, all frequencies have to. So busy in time and busy in frequency. Can you find a place where it is not busy? Yes. If I do, if I try to find which frequencies exist at which time, you can see here, but at a given, at any given time, there is only one frequency. So I can plot the time frequency trying to find out that at any given time there is only one frequency at any given time so this becomes sparse empty and empty so the time frequency representation makes the signal sparse huh? but it's very interesting here the signal is globally busy in time it is very busy you take the Fourier transform is very busy right but locally if you find the frequencies in a small window, it becomes a sparse. So we call it globally populated and sparse. This other man-made signal, these are two chirps. Again, this is time, this is frequency. Rising chirp, falling chirp. A sinusoid and a chirp. Two parallel chirps, a sinusoidal FM, right? Sparse, 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 empty, empty empty uh, two lines right two lines the occupancy what do you think the occupancy here five percent ten percent it still is very sparse right? biological signals if you look around you the dolphins the dolphins this is the time frequency of the dolphin speech sounds right this is time and this is frequency these vertical lines are clicks. Click, 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 click. Those lines are whistle. The dolphin can whistle and click at the same time. Can you? No. The dolphins are so smart, if they had hands, they would have civilization. So this is the dolphin sound. I I, 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 uh, I tag this as sparse. This is the best. This is the best sound, signal. So biological signals, sparse. This is a gravitation wave, nine, uh, 2019, a major event that they could measure it verify in the galaxy this is time and frequency this is sparse right in machine monitoring trying to find the knocking is sparse they're all sparse if you want to ignore that that's your problem but i will not ignore that right so again locally sparse but globally busy now this is sparse in this so i Sparse in the sensors, sparse in the signal, just finish it. I'm going to tell you now, sparse in the sensed. Try and look for cracks. That's actually in our lab. Right. Trying to find cracks in a pipe, water pipe, or in a, in a, on a plate. Right. So that is a sparse because you only have one flow on one crack. If you are looking underground, there is only one or two buried objects. In a building, usually are few people. That is sparse, right? This is sparse in the sensed, right? So let's talk about sparse of the scene now. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, five targets. Of course, that's not this room. Right? But things can be sparse in space. That means only few targets, like sparse in the sky, five planes. Right? Now, this is very busy scene, correct? If Dr. Ahmed Goma stands up and walks, and I image him while he's sitting, and I re-image the room after he made two steps and I subtract. 
all of you are gone except him all that shares are gone the podium is gone because nobody moves so when I image before and after his motion you disappear so what are you saying by the virtue of his motion I have converted a very busy scene to a sparse scene only one target right so of course I'm gonna see him before and after because when I subtract he's not cancelled right so when I do the subtraction here it is that's what he's setting and then that's after he took still what happened to the rest they are gone by the virtue of subtraction so before i told you you can convert a busy to sparse by transformation like fourier transform here you can convert busy to sparse by motion there is something else by the way suppose professor ahmed goma moves walks can he walk with 60 miles an hour no there is a what one meter per second the nominal uh, walking velocity of a human so his velocity is sparse there is only finite number or you can approximate finite only finite possibility of somebody walking <laughs> right he cannot walk 60 miles an hour right uh, so there is a sparsity in velocity we talked about the Doppler remember that one right this is activities of daily living walking in homes falling this is hand gestures right? so now you can do very automated using uh, man machine interface right? so you can command command the refrigerator command the uh, uh, the uh, the lighting in your house just by the virtue of motion and a radar will be seeing you right and this is we talked about rotor craft right? so if I were to take the signals bouncing from these objects and display it in time and frequency here is I showed you this before this is time this is frequency for this for the hand gestures this is time and this is frequencies look, look at this all of this empty empty right this somebody walking and this is the four blades of the rotor craft right? we we use this one for classifying uh, drones right so it is sparse target large vacant background okay so to recap when you have limited number of sensors and you have difficulty placing the sensors where you want it and when you have a signal that can be cast as sparse and you, when you have a scene that can cast as sparse you have a problem of sparsity if you don't account for it then you are not doing a good job because if you do you can solve so many problems okay so let's talk about the solution right so what's the sparse vector in general uh, sparse signals right so uh, a real or complex lens n vector is said to be k sparse if it contains just uh, k non zero entries. So if you have k non zero entries in the, in the vector, you call it as k sparse. Right? So the L0 uh, uh, counts, this is the norm, it counts the number of non zero elements. Right? Now, the vector doesn't have to be have to have zeros right it can be very small values so you can have very small values but two large values you, s you still can say this vector is compressible that means approximately sparse has only two right so it doesn't have to be zero zero right so we mentioned before that you can take a signal that's busy and you convert to, sp to sparse what you are doing is sparsifying the signal 
you are sparsifying the signal by looking at it at a different in a different domain right why would you sparsify the signal because once it is sparse i'm there because i'm going to utilize this property and there's a wavelet transform the fourier transform there are many things that you can sparsify the signal in the background so now here is the here is the main problem you have limited number of observations. Right. You don't have the full data. You have incomplete data. This is your observation. This is you have it, but it's not enough. Right. This is a scene. It's huge. You don't know what this scene. You want to solve for x. Right. But you solve for x without understanding that x is sparse. I solve for x with understanding that x is sparse. I win, you lose. Uh, this is A matrix, is the fat matrix, is the wide matrix. There is inference solution to this problem. Incomplete observations. This is the sparse. You can find them because it's called the minimum norm. For example, uh, Professor Magoma will know that. You know, minimum norm solution. Out of all this inference solution, minimum norm solution. Right. But the solution is not sparse. Right? The solution that you solve for it is not sparse. You have to do something else. And that is the whole area of compressive sensing. Right? So in compressive sensing theory suggests that a signal is sparse or compressive. The original signal can be reconstructed by exploiting a few measured values, which are much less than the ones suggested by previously used theories, such as Shannon sampling theory. That means when you have things sparse, you can solve the problem with few measurements of observations. And basically, again, just maybe this is the last equation, right? right? So we talked about wide observation and, and A, right? And alpha here is sparse. This psi is the sparsifying, it could be a Fourier transform, right? Can convert a busy to sparse. This will be the measurement matrix. That will be all the delays that we called before uh, A. But the things that you notice here, this vector is very short. This vector is very long. So the observation is much less than the unknowns. And this is the typical problem in a compressive sensing. So this is how you solve it now. Right? You solve using convex optimization. You are using here the L1 norm because it promotes sparsity. right? So you want to look for the sparsest possible vector subject to accuracy in the data model. That's observation, and this is the, the data model itself. Of course, you know psi, you know phi, and you know psi, and you know a. You don't know alpha. Right? So it becomes a convex optimization problem to utilize sparsity. And there are so many uh, uh, packages available in MATLAB and others that will help you to, to do this basis pursuit and lasso and all this. It's very straightforward, right? Uh, so let me, so basically now I'm going to use this. I'm going to be sparsity aware. Sparsity aware is nothing but this slide. I'm going to look for the sparsest vector because I know a priori that what I am sensing is sparse. So remember this one, 60% of the data is missing. I get this one. If I solve for it using that slide, I get this. That means with 40% of the data, I can get you, I didn't lose anything, but I utilized that vacant, 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 vacant. Remember this one here? 75% of the data missing. If I do sparse reconstruction, I get this one. Beautiful. With 25% of the data. Now, this is an experiment, right? And we have a radar imaging lab, so we build walls. Right? We look at things behind the wall. So we build this concrete. This is. Uh, a scanner. 
So basically, we transmit, receive. This is kind of a synthetic aperture, right? This is arm. It moves up and down. This antenna moves right and left. So we can have different position, populate this. Right? Behind this wall is me, sitting in the lab. That was a few years ago. Of course, I lost a few pounds since then. <laughs> So I'm going to show you. This is a very busy scene. Huh? Look at the door and the things, the bookshelves and all the things. So reflections from all over, right? Well, from the ground, from the ceiling, from everything. Look at this fascinating experiment. Basically, So all what I did, I imaged myself sitting down. Then I repeated the image after I swayed my body to the left. I repeated the experiment after I swayed my body to the right, front, and back. And then I subtracted. I imaged exactly what I showed you how I imaged. When I subtracted, Everything behind me is gone, except me because I, I wasn't canceled. Because when you subtract me, the next time I'm right here. Before, so, right. So, the sway of the body has converted a very cluttered, busy scene into a sparse scene. Once it's sparse. It's a home run for me. I, know. I don't have to have the full data. Right? So here, of course, this is radar imaging. We're not going to see my face and things. So, but here is, the, here is where I'm sitting right here in the red. This is with full data set, 100%. With 3.5% of the data, if I utilize sparsity, I even have better results. That's, that's me sitting there. 3.5% of the data. Utilizing the fact that nothing else in the room except me. Moving forward, moving to the left, and moving to the right, we got you. So there is another example. This is a ground penetrating radar that's by Georgia Tech. Right. So you have three uh, objects. Then here the full data, right? Even with the full data, because the full data you have Fourier transform, you have side loops and all the things. But when you have the sparse, right? I think this is uh, this is ten percent of the data, if I'm not mistaken. This is the structure health monitoring example. You have uh, two cracks. We put the sensors there around. We're able to get them right here. How much time I have? Because uh, a few more minutes or? OK. So this is the last, thing, last section I'm going to talk about. So thus far. I showed you that if you have prior information that what you are trying to find out few sparse then you must utilize this property whether you have the full data or not this is now a different topic but still is sparse right so you have a number of sensors doesn't matter what it is you can arrange them in a linear array, rectangular array, or a circular array. We call this uniform uh, configuration. Right? This one here is non-uniform. So I took those sensors, and I said, I'm not going to put them equally spaced. 
I'm going to put them non-uniform. You say, why? I say, wait. Okay. So there must be a conversation between me, I own the sensors, and you who are trying to solve the, the, the problem. They say, giving a number of sensors, where do you place them? So I'm asking you. Right? You have to come back and ask me, so what do you have in mind? I say, well, I want to achieve optimality. I want to place them such as that I get the optimum solution. Then I have to ask you, optimum of what exactly? Optimum in what? Right? There are several criteria for optimality, criteria for optimality, right? But I show you that this is a uniform linear array. I could do this. Professor Taufiq can say, well, you know, I want to rearrange those sensors. I'm going to put them there. I have to say, well, why did you choose these positions? He can answer, because this position gives you the most accurate localization the highest signal to noise ratio, the highest signal to interference and noise ratio. You change the criterion, you change the positions. Not one size fits all. You tell me what you're trying to accomplish. I tell you where you put them. Okay. So there is something called structure arrays that they follow a certain formula. And there is non-structure array depending on the environment. For example, if the target is here, I have this arrangement. If the target is there, I reconfigure. It's called reconfigurable arrays. Reconfigurable. They reconfigure themselves to get you the best possible solution all the time. So here is the most fascinating part. You see the sensors here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are received sensors. If I tell you that mathematically, mathematically, these sensors are equivalent to those, you're not going to believe me. But it's true. What are these? Oh, virtual virtual sensors. These are the physical. But mathematically, because of the spacing, I choose the spacing such as that I have so many virtual sensors and will give me better answer, high resolution, better detection, and so forth. This is called the difference co-array. So when we say as if, that means equivalent to. But if you have a uniform linear array, as if it is themselves, <laughs> right? You start with seven, you end up with seven. So uniform linear array is not a de facto. Uniform array, you have to have a good reason to say, I'm going to put this uniformly, equally spaced. Now, this is for passive. Receive only. How about if you are active? You emit from the blue and you receive from the red. As if you receive from the green. So you feel that. This is, by the way, uniform, but this is sparse. Sparse transmitter, uniform receiver. So what you do, how, how do you get this one? You add, you sum the coordinates. By the way, this one, you subtract the coordinates. You subtract the coordinate, that's why you get the positions. Here, the active, you add the coordinates. There's something, give you another example. Suppose you have transmitter, each one of those is transmitter receiver. You put them on the boundary of a rectangular. So the equivalent, you add their position coordinates. So if you were to add this position to this position, this position to this position, this position to this position, 
you fill in the interior then if you deal with this position and this position this position this position all of a sudden you have this array fascinating you start with sensors around the perimeter of a rectangular you end up with this right this is another example here is the transmitters and here is the receiver now you add the coordinates when you add you shift so this one as if you have these receivers here so when you try to place your sensors you need to consult the literature especially the most recent because depending what you are trying to accomplish every goal traces back to a configuration that not necessarily obvious right? so I will end just to show you that uh, for example if I transmit from this orange or red and receive from the purple I sum the coordinates then if I do the difference I maintain that this transmit receive is equivalent to all of this receiving mathematically as if so first of all before you trying to study where you put your antennas ask yourself am I passive or active am I receiving only or transmitting receive right? because each one has its own uh, mathematical treatment one you subtract one you add the, co the coordinates right so just to give an example so this is uh, 7 5 plus 7 this is 12 this is 12 antennas right I place them in such a way that this is the equivalent right? they call it the co-array this is the equivalent uh, uh, array mathematically this is equivalent so I place them in a sparse configuration this is the equivalent to it this is 12 an uh, uh, antennas I can actually localize 39 sources with only 12 sensors and that is unheard of when you have a linear uniform array this is another uh, last example that's for the Samco array I was able not only to localize sources but the multi pass the sources could be multi pass as well so it can be coherent as well so in conclusions right, I tried to glue different aspects of research in the past 10 years for you right uh, I worked on sparse array, I worked on compressive sensing and all the things. There are two messages you can walk home with, right? If you are in the sensing business, biomedical, uh, urban, uh, anything, you know, any modality, passive or, or active, ask yourself before you draw a single line in your problem before you go to the library before you check the IEEE database right? am I sensing a sparse event ninety nine percent yes then the second question is well how sparse is sparse you have, you have to it comes, uh, because the sparser the better you are is it 10 percent occupancy one percent occupancy right you have to clear that first if you are convinced that what you are sensing is sparse then do not pretend that you don't know that because you are not uh, solving the problem uh, properly adequately the second question you have to ask yourself is that where do you place your sensors you have to be creative you have to be flexible and you have to 
uh, first understand what are you achieving from these senses? What, what is your metric? What is the criterion for evaluation? What is your objective? What is your goal? Right. To localize with millimeter accuracy or find the angles with millimeter accuracy or to remove the noise, to remove the jammer. All of this has impact and influence on how you choose your sensor positions. We'll stop here. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, it's very nice. Thank you for, for the nice presentation. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the concept of transforming busy to sparse, <laughs> sparse yeah. is really interesting. And actually, it's, it's, uh, we can use it in our lifestyle. Sometimes we need to focus on the most important items, other than C, busy. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually the uh, philosophical aspect of the sparsity, <laughs> which uh, is very impo most important. Right? Yeah, don't don't get uh, distracted by the small things. Look at the important things in life, yeah. and and you find it sparse. <laughs> okay, so any questions? Any questions? Yeah, I think it's Body sensors uh, application. Um, and, and how are you Yeah, so uh, yes, it's a good question. So I myself did a lot of things uh, for healthcare, uh, looking into, um, and I think I gave uh, last talk on that, uh, trying to find out, for example, uh, whether uh, the person has uh, physical impairments or cognitive affecting the limbs and the motion and how you move your legs. So we're able to use the sparsity in trying to uh, classify the gait, the way the person moves, right? Uh, so that's for healthcare. But there is, there is a lot of work in, uh, in biomedical sensing, especially in the ultrasound, in the ultrasound area because that's how people look into uh, anomalies and growth in the body, right? Uh, the, the, uh, of course, that's not easy because there is a reflection from the bone, the reflection from the things, right? So, uh, for example, uh, uh, the Doppler, because the blood moves, right? So they can, they can uh, work on this problem uh, separately. But uh, if, if, if somebody goes to the doctor and they do CAT scan or X-rays and, and the doctor will actually zoom in and point to something that's different from the background. That's sparse. Exactly, exactly, right. So the, the question here is that uh, it doesn't have to be zeros, it, but the background has to be different from the target in terms of the reflection, the strength, and things like this. Because you can always scale, right? So uh, certainly if... Uh, if you Google sparsity and biomedical application, you find many. many right. yeah, it's very, very, very important. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's one there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, see, yeah, right. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I, read, uh, I read before about uh, the blanks can speak already, already <laughs> each other. Yeah. And, uh, no, see, see, once, once the signal is in voltage and current, yeah. you can do anything. So once you sense and you convert what you sensed into current and voltage, you can, you can create an image to it, you can hear it, right? In fact, you can feed it to a vibration and you can feel it. I mean, it because, you know, you can, you, things can vibrate. You can put electric current and things vibrate, right? So once it is in electronic yeah. format, 
how you choose to look, to hear, to feel, that's your choice. Right? So in the example I gave you, in fact, it's very important because sometimes the ear uh, is better sensor than the eyes, you know, especially for a well-trained. Right? So that, by the way, the example, that was not, that was actual technology. The guy who heard the, uh, the person walking, that was the actual technology and uh, was very trained to tell you that uh, there is a fighting going on in this room, right? Uh, it's, you know, you can tell there are kids running just from the sound, right? And that's using radar, right? So you're uh, doing electromagnetic waves, you're receiving it, then you have it in voltage and current. Then you feed that into a speaker. Yes, the sound, of course, the acoustics, you can get the acoustics, yeah. and then you can, you can modulate it to a different frequencies. So, according to that, you can receive the biological signals to, uh, to uh, uh, a human signal, which is so they, I wanted to, uh, to understand how they convert to the biological no, because, because, you know, because when you sensed, right, yeah. I mean, it's all electronics, right, when you have voltage and current, right? That, that voltage cannot tell you, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm an acoustic voltage, right? Or, the, or uh, current can tell you, no, I'm ultrasound current, right? It's current and voltage, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Then, then, but the wavelengths, that is your own doing. I mean, this is all relative, right? The frequency is all relative. Uh, this is samples, right? Because you have samples. You can tag those samples as 100 kilo samples per second or five samples per second. That's, that's your own definition, right? So when you feed that, you instruct the, the player to recognize the samples as best samples per second, right? And that actually can get you the, the modality that you are asking. So uh, very good uh, question. Uh, actually, uh, her background is chemical. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so it's, it's okay. very good to, very different from this topic, but I'm happy that you enjoy it. Very good. Uh, I yeah, have another question. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I, I have a question about the Georgia Tech uh, example. Uh, okay. I don't know. They are, they are not, they are fixed, right? How they detect? The yeah. So they, they have a, 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 a transmitter receiver, then they move it. Okay. So they move it. Uh, that, that, that is the synthetic aperture. Okay. That then they collect, then they do the image the way I explained it but before. It's, it's should be like yeah ex like exactly that. yeah yeah right. so of course you know uh, you don't want to walk away uh, uh, far from from the buried one but you have to have sufficient average yeah. okay uh, there is a question uh, from the Facebook ignoring the neutral uh, coupling if 2d antenna array a and B have equal element number of elements and the a has got more virtual lags if the if this guarantee that a has better 2D DOA estimation than B? Well, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the question for mutual coupling is certainly the person knows what he's saying. Uh, because uh, in many cases, the moment we talk about sparse array, the first question is about how mutual coupling uh, plays out. Right? So we published actually uh, several papers on mutual coupling for sparse arrays, and I invite uh, the person who asked the question to, uh, to check that because this is very important. Uh, uh, because the mutual coupling for uniform linear array is well understood. The mutual coupling for sparse array needs some investigation, but we solved that problem. Uh, so uh, if you know the mutual coupling, or if you can model the mutual coupling, or if you can learn about mutual coupling by the experiments, you can equalize it before you move on and do anything else. Once you equalize it, equalize it then you can deal with the problem as if there is no mutual coupling. Uh, but it's a very important point that was brought up, and uh, uh, just check, uh, you can write my name and uh, write mutual coupling, you'll see. We publish journal papers and conference papers. Okay, any other questions? Okay. By the way, he's my former student. Okay. <laughs> so that's scary, now he's going to ask questions. <laughs> Yes, yes. I'm, I'm working at the other side of this. So, if you're trying to sense my research and some of the things that I'm, I'm working on, it's trying to make things invisible. So, have, have there been any uh, 
investigation on the effect, for example, of non-linearity or the other topic. If you cover uh, your target, be as someone from an electromagnetic background, or some sort of a non-linear loop or something like that, how significant is the effect of, uh, of this non-linear loop? On the sparse, on yes. the sparse. Yes. No, I mean that's an excellent point. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not aware of it. You know, maybe Professor Hurfer, uh, he can know. But that's a, a very important uh, point. No, I haven't looked into that. Uh, that work. So that's something uh, like Professor Angata also did that. Yeah, yeah Dr. Hurfer probably will uh, because he is a co-author on some of the papers that we published on uh, on mutual coupling actually. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, I'll back, thank you. Okay, L last question. Uh, what is the uh, example that you choose 25% uh, of data from a full data? Uh, what algorithm did you use to select this person? Very good. So, <coughs> so, I always say, okay, so you have 100% of the data, right? Are you following? So I do this, hind, right? and then randomly I collect 25%. It doesn't matter, right? So sometimes you picked, uh, talk about antenna position and frequency. You picked maybe 10 antenna position and three frequencies, right? So randomly chosen. There is no algorithm to tell you you should uh, choose a 25% such as that, no. Random, random uh, selection, right? Uh, uh, but certainly, I mean, you have antennas and frequency. Don't, don't uh, select the 25% all frequencies and only one antenna, right? I mean, you have to have kind of a balance a little bit, right? But the whole idea here is that so because sometimes it is enforced on you, it's not by your choice. So you cannot say, well, 25%, I need more of, uh, of frequencies and antennas and things. You know, you have to work whatever given to you. Right? But uh, typically, if you have enough number of antennas and frequencies, you will do a very good job. By the way, I mean, we went to 3%, 25% that's plenty, went to 3%, right? But the sparser the event, the scene, the fewer the observation you need. You can go from 25% to 1%, but the, your scene cannot be busy. It has to be sparse, very sparse. So if you go, because the number of measurements, there is a bound related to the sparsity of the scene. So if you increase the sparsity, make the scene sparser, you can afford going down in the measurements from 25% to 5% to 3% to so forth. So, right? But again, even if the scene is busy and you have the full data, not even at the scene, if you have the full data, not to 25%, if you have the full data right, and the scene is sparse, you have to solve for a sparse solution. Whether it is 100% available or 25% or 50%, you have to utilize the fact that your scene is sparse in order to get the best possible solution. Whether it's localization or whether it is detection or whether it is classification. I mean, so you win on all fronts. About the optimization technique you are using, uh, which one uh, did you use, like the militaristic uh, optimization technique? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of uh, compass optimization techniques uh, uh, available. We use the, uh, the lasso, and uh, I, th I think it's used the interior point. But these techniques uh, uh, it's become very mature and now streamlined. Uh, and MATLAB has a very, that's why I think it's a very easy area to get into. Because, and like this, I mean, you, all what you have to do, define the parameters and let the MATLAB, right? But there are still a lot of research, you know, sometimes the problem is not convex, you have to convex guide the problem, and there are many techniques that you say, because one of the, uh, the problems for real time is still, I mean, you talk about the Fourier transfer FFT versus solving this one. So. One of the uh, opponents, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the again is the optimization. Say, oh, well, it takes time. 
right? So there's a lot of work in the last 10 years about speeding up these optimization techniques because this is uh, iterative techniques, right? It's yes. recursive, right? Uh, but it converges very fast and uh, conditional convergence has been established. So there are, uh, every day there is a faster algorithm to solve the problem, right? Uh, uh, but when it comes to uh, convex optimization, I am more of a user than an inventor. So I use uh, the, the available to me, right? okay. Okay. but I let the invention for the mathematician. Thank, <laughs> <you very laughs> thank you very much. So by the end, I'd like to thank you, Professor Mon Monis, for this nice talk. Actually, I'm, I'm really happy for the way you explain the topic uh, from the uh, very small uh, full level to the top level. Um, I, I know that uh, you have many papers on this topic and uh, lots of questions. Maybe people would like to uh, check, can check your publication on that. I'd like to thank you all for attending this session. Uh, and talking about uh, compressive sensing, I want to uh, present this, my, uh, my book on compressive sensing for radar okay. to the uh, Nile University Library. Thank and you very it's much. It's pleasure and best wishes. It's our pleasure and to have uh, other two books for you <laughs> again. Uh, okay, I would like to thank you again. So the message today is sparsity aware. Try to focus <laughs> okay. on the main targets in your life. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay.